Hello, folks. Welcome. Really glad you're here. We'll get going soon. Got a good crowd tonight. Welcome all new subscribers. We've grown a little bit in the last few weeks. <laughs> Hello, Deborah Potter. Yes, please use the chat to let folks know where you're from. Uh, we have a national community here. We're now more than 60 thousand strong. It's hard to even believe um, that we've grown that much. Cheryl, by the way, Cheryl Johnson, who is such an amazing contributor to our community and our chat, for those of you who are not paid subscribers, um, we do so much interesting work in our chat. Cheryl's been amazing. And um, and I'm not going to, all the communication with me tonight is going to be over the Q&A in the chat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any, we're not, there's just too many people here to start bringing people into the conversation uh, physically. And so just hope everyone understands that. So if you've got a question, um, <clears throat> just, um, wow, uh, just got a new new poll. Okay. Um, and so just, yeah, let us know. Uh, so much fun, isn't it? I mean, I don't know, but for those of you who are on the, event we did with Tom Swazi after the election, you know, we played a major role in Tom Swazi getting elected our the Hopium community. Thanks, everybody. And Tom came on two days after the election to thank us all. We happened to have an event and this was going on the chat, you know, people saying where they were from. And he was like focused on that. And I was like trying to talk to him and he, and he was more interested in seeing where everybody was from, you know, and just this idea of this national community that we're all creating through Zoom and through all of our work. It was just, it was so funny. I mean, it's the, you know, for those of us who've been in the business for a long time, this new Zoom based community and all of you in the grassroots groups around the country, this is kind of new stuff and it's really exciting. It's part of the reason I'm doing Hopium, you know. Um, and I will say that for those of you, before I begin formally, we'll begin in a second, is that I am going to be in Phoenix in an in-person event on Thursday and I'll be in Arlington, Virginia for an in-person event on Saturday. I'm starting to do more in-person events. I haven't done a lot of them um, since we founded this. The information for both of those are on the website. I'm also going to be going to Michigan, I mean, to Wisconsin and Minnesota, um, and uh, and then hopefully other states. Is, and and I'll be in New York in the sp later the spring. <clears throat> so I'm going to be trying to do some in-person events to to be able to start meeting some of you in person. Um. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me get going. Um, yes, Tucson. Thank you, Susan, Suzanne, thank you for calling about Ukraine, right? <laughs> okay, let's get going. And um, this is recorded. And so it gets seen by many more people than just here tonight. Thank you. I did get a haircut. Um, you know, Talio, for those of you in the DC area, they're on Wisconsin Avenue in Upper Georgetown. Um, and uh, I was <laughs> happy. I needed, desperately needed a haircut. So thank you for noticing. Um, okay, let's get going. Let me drink water here. Um, <clears throat> hey, everybody. Simon Rosenberg uh, here from Hopium Chronicles. This is our monthly gathering of the entire Hopium community, um, paid members and just general subscribers. Um, really grateful to be here with all of you. We do this once a month. Um, and try to give you advance notice so you can build in. And if you are not able to see it live, it's always recorded and, and shared afterwards on both my site at Hopium Chronicles and also on YouTube. What I'm going to do is speak for about 15, 20 minutes, give you my general sense of where things are, and then we'll use um, time in the rest of the chat to discuss, you know, to take your questions and have a conversation all the way to the top of the hour. So thank you all for, for being here. Look, my basic take on where things are now, and some of you have heard me talk at other events, is that Joe Biden is a good president. The country's better off. Um, we have a very strong case for re-election. I'm fixing my mic here. Um, the Democratic Party is strong, unified, raising tons of money, and we're winning elections all across the country. And they have Trump. And Trump is the ugliest political thing that any of us have ever seen. And their party is increasingly looked 
looking more like a dumpster fire than a serious political party. And so let's break those three things down, right? Number one, number two, number three. Number one, Joe Biden's been a good president. I mean, remember that when Joe Biden became president in January, 2021, we had just had, you know, we were in the midst of COVID before the vaccines had come. Hundreds of thousands of people had died unnecessarily due to Trump's mismanagement of the pandemic. The economy was in free fall. The global economy was on the edge. We had just had the first not peaceful transfer of power in American history. There was no formal transition the way that usually happens when one government transitions to the other. And the city of Washington was essentially under military occupation because the capital of the United States had just been attacked in an armed attack led by Trump. Um, when on one of the only days that all 435 members are there at the same time. And so when Joe Biden came into office, it was one of the most dangerous and scary moments that any president has come into the White House. And his central promise to us was that he was gonna get us to the other side of COVID. And he has, I mean, today, the American economy has the strongest recovery of any G7, any advanced country in the world. Our inflation rate is lower here than any other advanced country in the world. Stock market's been breaking records. We have the best job market since the 1960s, the lowest uninsured rate in American history. We've got a far higher than normal levels of new business formation, which means small businesses, which is a sign of incredible health and vitality in the American economy, including among black and Hispanic entrepreneurs. Um, you know, with the deficit is trillions of dollars less, real wages have been growing much faster than, I mean, wages have been growing much faster than inflation for many, many months now. And yes, inflation was high here, but it was high everywhere. It was a global phenomenon driven by COVID supply chain disruptions, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, the Russian attack on Ukraine, and OPEC raising, repeatedly raising gas prices here and all around the world. Um, you know, inflation was not unique to the United States. And frankly, it's come, it's done much better here than in many other advanced economies. You know, I could go on and on and on. The three big bills that Biden passed are going to be creating opportunity for American workers and American families for generations to come. He's dramatically accelerated the energy transition and will go down in history as one of the most consequential figures in all of world history in fighting climate change. If you're a younger worker today, you're entering a workforce, a, work, a workplace where more um, young people have ins health insurance than any time in modern American history. The job market's better, as I said, than it's been since the 1960s. Because of the Democratic Party, minimum wages have been raised in cities all across the country. So the floor for new workers is much higher than it used to be. Um, even with high interest rates, we've seen Gen uh, Z has home ownership rates equal to or even above Gen X and millennials. So, you know, if you're a young worker, you're entering a very, very healthy work environment and, and, and a work environment full of opportunity. So I feel good about what we've done and the argument we're going to be able to make. And I think, frankly, Joe Biden's success as president has caused most of the major attacks against him to evaporate in the last few months. And I think this is actually a very consequential evolution of this election. Every election changes, right? It evolves, it changes, it grows, right? And what's happening in the last few months is that I think you've seen an evaporation of the central attacks Republicans have been making on Biden. The economy is strong, it's not weak. Inflation is down, it's not up. Remember, inflation last week was one-tenth of a point higher than expected. One-tenth of a point. Right? It was not, you know, which is within margin of error of the data. We have to not assess that as being you know, dangerous. Frankly, the Fed statements today, I think were, were fairly modest in that regard. Um, and you know, we crime rates aren't raging, they're actually plummeting. You know, violent crime and murder rates are plummeting. Crime rates and murder rates went way up under Trump. They've come way down under Biden. The deficit went way up under Trump. It's come way down under Biden. Um, the war on energy that the Republicans talk about all the time, it was one of the worst wars in energy in history because last year we produced more renewables, more gas and more oil than any year in American history. We're more energy independent than we've been in decades. And we actually produced more oil in America last year than any country has ever produced in the history of the world. And so this idea that Joe Biden had somehow strangled the American energy industry, when they also, by the way, were you know, getting record profits is just an absurdity. Um, on, on the border, which was an area of vulnerability for us, 
Donald Trump in his repeated idiocy, and we'll talk more about his idiocy tonight because I think his idiocy is actually also becoming a material part of this election. In his idiocy, he turned something that was an advantage to them into something that was an advantage for us. You know, we're now the party that's pursued order at the border. Joe Biden patiently negotiated a bipartisan bill. He made huge concessions to Republicans and Donald Trump intervened and killed it. And we actually litigated all these issues in New York three in the Swazi race. All the Republicans did in that race was basically talk about immigration. And that race was supposed to be, you know, the polling had us winning that race by two to three points. We won by eight points. It was a blowout. And where the central area of, lit of litigation of where we battled with them was on this issue of border and, and immigration and the border and the Republicans lost badly. And then finally, on the two major issues that Republicans have, have gone after Biden on as a person, the Biden cr crime family story we've now learned was a Russian disinformation op laundered by rancid Republican politicians into our discourse again. And then the issue of his age, which is an issue, right? We can't run away from it. It's part of the discourse. But I think Biden did a lot to assuage people's concerns about his age. I think you're hearing about it a lot, a lot less than used to be when we did these kinds of conversations. And also, we know that the special counsel's a, a, a tr attempt to claim that Biden showed issues of cognitive decline during the interview was actually a lie, and it was made up, and it was not backed up by the actual transcript, which was also just a very low moment in many low moments in this MAGA era. So I think in terms of Joe Biden is a good president, we have a strong record to run on. We do. Second, the Democratic Party is strong in winning elections all across the country. We're unified, raising tons of money. You all know this. I talk about this a lot. This is the core of the Hopium narrative. You know, I think that we're building, because of all of you and the Democratic grassroots, we're building the most powerful Democratic political machine that we've ever seen. You know, we've since Dobbs, you know, we did really well in 2018 and 2020. <clears throat> but then in 2020, you know, we won the House, the Senate, the presidency. But what we've done since the spring of 2022 may be even more miraculous because the party in power in America, in our system, always loses seats and always loses ground. And we actually have been gaining ground in election after election. It's a remarkable historic anomaly. It's something, you know, that should be getting, frankly, far more attention than it does. You know, in, in the fall, in the general election in 2022, we actually overperformed our 2020 numbers in Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. We got to 59% in Colorado, 57% in Pennsylvania, 55 in Michigan, 54 in New Hampshire. Those were amazing results in a good year. And those, was, those were our results in what was supposed to be a bad year, a red wave year. We gained a Senate seat. We gained state legislative chambers. We gained governorships. We gained ground in 2022 despite the historical headwinds against us and high inflation, uh, low Biden approval. And then that same basic dynamic that we saw in 2022 of Democratic overperformance and Republican struggle carried out in 2023. We flipped the Wisconsin Supreme Court seat in April together, and which has ended the redistricting in Wisconsin. We then won Colorado Springs and Jacksonville, Florida in May, two of the largest Republican held cities in the country. During the summer and fall, we won special elections all across the country. We outperformed 2020 numbers by five points in special elections for the House and Senate all across the country, the State House and State Senate all across the country. We then took away the six week abortion ban in Ohio, getting to 57% in both the August ballot initiative and then the November ballot initiative, despite the entire Republican political machine and the governor fighting with all they had to protect the six week ban. We then flipped the Virginia Assembly, which is something this community worked unbelievably hard on. We raised hundreds of thousands of dollars into Virginia, and many of you volunteered in Virginia. We flipped the Assembly, kept the Senate, did something that many people on the ground didn't even think was possible by flipping the Assembly. And, that, and flipping the Assembly did a few things. One is it elected the first African-American speaker in Virginia's history in the heart of the Confederacy. Second is that it it took away, I think, this fantasy Republicans had that the 15-week ban, because Youngkin ran on the 15-week ban in the in the Virginia in the in November, was sort of an escape hatch for them on an issue that's causing them extraordinary political pain, as it should. And so that was an incredibly important psychic victory for us. We also gained ground in New Jersey. We won mayoralties 
and city council races and school board races all across the country. 2023 was a blue wave year. And then the question would be, is that that basic dynamic, our overperformance, their struggle show up in 2024? And it has. <clears throat> in New York 3, which was, we were all told, it was this massive bellwether that was going to tell us everything we needed to know about the general election. You know, we were ahead in the polls there by two to three points, and we won by eight points. That was another election this community went in really heavy on. Thank you all very much. It was a huge win for us in New York 3. We flipped the Tom Keene house race in, in, uh, in Orlando, Florida in January. And Joe Biden had no significant challenge, right? There was no primary challenge against him. Uh, he had two candidates run against him, Robert Kennedy and um, uh, Dean Phillips, and both of them you know, failed to launch basically and didn't get anywhere. And the party has remained remarkably unified under Joe Biden. And we're also raising tons of money and we're about to now get the reports from the House and Senate campaigns that have begun to come in. And we have huge financial advantages over the Republicans in the state in the Senate races and the House races the way we did in 2022, right? Because of all of you are rising or, you know, are rising to the, to the call, right? And doing the work we need to do to win. And on the Republican side, Trump underperformed his public polling. Um, he, the RNC is an unbelievable turmoil. They are not yet, they are so far behind in building a general election operation um, that they're not gonna be able to build a traditional general election operation. It's too late, that takes too much time. It's like building a battleship. They are struggling to raise hard dollars. House Republicans are abandoning ship in record levels. They're not even just retiring. They're quitting on two weeks notice. We've never seen anything like this. The Republican Party as an institution is an unprecedented dumpster fire. There's an unprecedented rebellion against Trump happening from two former vice presidents to the former uh, nominee of their party to Liz Cheney, Adam Kissinger, make your long list of people. There is an incredible unprecedented effort by Republicans to prevent Trump from being president. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. Donald Trump is the ugliest political thing we've ever seen. And the Republican Party is an incredible dumpster fire. You know, and, and then that gets us to Trump, right? And not only is Trump all of those things that I just discussed, but I think what's gonna become very material in this debate, in this election, is there are six things voters are about to find out about Donald Trump that they didn't know about him before. Not that you know he wears more makeup than a drag queen, and not that he's on trial for you know having that involves him having sex with a porn star while his wife was home with their newborn baby, right? That's not just the things that they're going to come to know about him, or that his new company is in free fall, or that he's, um, or that uh, what else, or that he's still you know far more obeyant to Vladimir Putin than he is to the American Constitution. <clears throat> what they're going to come to learn is six things that I think are going to become very material in people's understanding of who he is now, Trump 2024. Number one is that he raped E. Jean Carroll in a department store dressing room. That's a fact. Number two, that he oversaw one of the largest financial frauds in American history, and the penalties could be up close to half a billion dollars. Number three is that he stole America's secrets. He lied to the FBI about it. He shared those secrets with other people and committed what may be one of the largest security breaches in the Western, in the history of the modern West. Fourth is that he led an insurrection against the United States of America, that he led an armed attack on the Capitol, that he tried to end American democracy for all time, and that he's promised to finish the job in January of 2025 if he's in the White House. Fifth, that he and his family have corruptly taken more money from foreign governments than any political family in American history. And sixth, something that we were reminded of remarkably this week is that he's singularly responsible for ending Roe and stripping the rights and freedoms away of more than half the population. I do want to note that what happened in this last, I think Donald Trump is having a truly awful April. <clears throat> Not only is he in trial and looking ridiculous and falling asleep and all the things that are in, and is a, is a shade of orange that doesn't exist in nature these days for reasons that is hard to even understand. But what happened, I think, on abortion, it's really important we drill down on this for a second, because I think this is going to really matter. So Arizona and Florida, the Supreme Court in both states, you know, strip away the rights and freedoms away of women in those two states where abortion was legal up until a few, you know, where there, it will become illegal in a few days. Um, and it's a sign that MAGA is expanding and growing, that 
the, if you were scared of MAGA in 2018, 2020, 2022, and 2023, MAGA 2024 is far scarier, more dangerous, because it's continuing to escalate and grow. It's continuing to take rights and freedoms away from people. It's not receding. But what Trump did in his management of this, I think is really important to, to talk about for a minute, because it was a sign, I think, of his decline and his idiocy and his inability to really navigate the complexity of this election. He came out of the box with this kind of what he believed to be this really genius idea that I'm going to come out for, the, you know, to let the states decide this. But what that was, was an endorsement of the most extreme abortion restriction, restrictions in the country. Donald Trump now is for the Idaho bill law, which is no exceptions and also has penalties for doctors and trafficking of minors in getting abortion out of state. He's now for the six week abortion ban in Florida, which is polls at 22% in Florida. He's for the Arizona ban, even though he now somehow tried to claim that he wasn't right. But if he's for the states deciding, then he is now embraced and endorsed the most restrictive uh, possible man manifestations of right wing extremism on this issue. And so, whereas two weeks ago, Donald Trump was the guy singularly responsible for ending Roe. Now he's the most dangerous abortion extremist in America with no near peer. And because he embraced and endorsed all these incredibly restrictive abortion initiatives. And if he's okay with Idaho doing it, then he'll be okay with any state doing it, which means that he's okay with the whole country doing it. And that Donald Trump has made it very clear where he stands, which is that he's an enthusiast He's ambitious about stripping the rights and freedoms away of women. It's core to who he is. And it's why we can't possibly let him win. And then finally on polls, all of you who listen to Hopium know that my basic view is that once the general election began and the Biden campaign turned on, that we would see Biden's numbers come up in polling. And that's exactly what's ha happened, right? We're two to three points better than we were six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. Uh, you know, I just did an analysis um, the other last night, that of the last 22 polls taken, national polls taken, um, Biden leads in nine, Trump leads in eight, and there are five that are tied, which means that the overwhelming majority polls that have taken in the last few weeks have Biden ahead or tied and Trump not ahead. Trump is not ahead anymore. The race has changed. The election's changing. Elections change all the time, right? This election's changing. It's getting bluer. It's getting better for us. We also now know that in the states, I want to be very clear about this because this comes up all the time. We don't have a lot of polling in the states. That's why I don't write about it very much. There's not, you know, we have dozens and dozens of national polls and more data is better than less data. And I'm a little bit more on firmer ground, I think, when I talk about national polls. We've had very few state polls. Um, many of the state polls have actually been done by Republican leaning institutions like the Wall Street Journal and the um, there was another one that just came out recently that was a Republican set of polls. And we do know that in recent weeks we've had polls of Democrats being ahead in Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Last week we had two really remarkable polls in North Carolina showing the race being essentially tied between Biden and Trump and the Quinnipiac poll in North Carolina had Josh Stein beating Mark Robinson by eight points. If we beat Mark Robinson by eight points in North Carolina, you know, we're going to win North Carolina. Biden's going to win North Carolina. So we also had very encouraging polling in North Carolina. We all know that our instinct is that Arizona, where Ruben Gallego was already beating Kerry Lake in public polling, probably got a lot better for us in recent days. And so, you know, when I look at the battleground states, I'm okay. I mean, things are going to continue to improve for us there. The idea that we're winning the popular vote but not winning in the battleground, that's not true. I mean, the data doesn't say that. The Wall Street Journal poll, which was paid for by Rupert Murdoch and whose pollster was Trump's own pollster who works on the campaign, which I'm sorry, I'm not going to put any stock into a poll that's done by Rupert Murdoch and the Trump campaign pollster, is that there just isn't conclusive data. Also, another measure we have of, of evaluating the health of the two parties, which is called the congressional generic which is, are you voting Democrat, Republican for Congress, has two thirds of the recent congressional generics have been, uh, have been uh, plus Democrat. Democrats have been ahead in the congressional generic. So I feel really good about where we are um, in the election. And Ben Mycelis from Midas Touch just um, texted me, actually, as we were starting the show, 
that a new echelon poll, which is a Republican based poll that had Trump ahead by four points, um, six weeks, they poll every two weeks, had Trump ahead six points, had Trump ahead four points um, a month ago, had Trump ahead two points uh, two weeks ago, has Biden up three points today. This is a Republican pollster showing, like I showed in my own post the other night, you know, the there have been polls now, the New York Times poll just moved four points in our direction. You know, there have been a series of polls that are moving two, four, six points in our direction. We now have Echelon, which is seen as a credible Republican pollster, not a not a wild Republican pollster, um, who's seen the race shift from being plus four Trump to plus three Biden in the last few weeks. There's no question the election is getting bluer and that we're in a far stronger position. Are where we want to be? Are we are we where we want to be? No. We have a lot of work to do in 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 getting and getting our wandering co what I call our wandering coalition to come home, and but the assumption of our theory of the case was that a big chunk of our wandering coalition would come home once the election began, and you're actually seeing that Nate Cohn in the New York Times has written who's done polls that have scared many of you, in his analysis of their latest poll showing the race dead even, said that there is now clear evidence the Democratic coalition is starting to come home, and. My view is that what is the likely scenario, and I've been saying this for months for all of you Hopium folks, is that we'd be up by two or three points by the spring. I think we're on track for that. And then we have a campaign to go get the rest and to blow it out and to win this election by hopefully more than just a few points, but by winning it big. Finally, I want to say that I don't ascribe to the theory that you know the battleground is three to four points more Republican than the popular vote. It may be. It was in 2020. It wasn't in 2022. Republicans actually won the national popular vote in 2022, and we won in the battlegrounds. So the exact opposite happened. And people have to be very careful. Here's my sort of final admonition to everybody is that 2024 is like only one other election, which is 2024. It's not like any other election. I think comparisons to other elections are useless in doing political analysis. Every election is unique and sui generis. And particularly, I think any comparisons to 2016 and 2020 are not very useful because of all the things I talked about earlier, all this new information, because Donald Trump is not the same candidate he was in 2016 and 2020. He's weaker. He's more degraded. His performance on the stump is far more erratic and disturbing. They can't even let him go campaign anymore, right? Because he says such crazy stuff when he's campaigning. He's, you know, in court. He's campaigning from the courthouse, not the White House. His, his agenda is more extreme and more dangerous. He has those six things that I discussed earlier. He's a far weaker and more beatable candidate than he was in 2016 and 2020. I'm not scared of him and neither should any of you be in my view. We can go win this election. We have to put our heads down, do the work. We have to do more, worry less. I think we worry too much as a family for good reason, right? I mean, if we stumble, our democracy slips away but it's not warranted based on the data in front of us and the picture that I'm painting. We should win this election. If we work hard and bust our ass the next six and a half months, we should win. And I'm really proud to be in this fight with all of you. And now let's get, and then I'll end by this. <clears throat> Joe Biden is a good Democrat. I mean, I'm sorry, let me reset. Joe Biden is a good president. The country is better off. We have a very strong case for reelection. The Democratic party is strong, unified, raising tons of money, winning elections all across the country. And they have Trump, the, ugly, the ugliest political thing that any of us have ever seen. In every way imaginable, six and a half months before the election, I would much rather be us than them. And there's no group of people I'd rather be fighting for, with and for than all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's get to the q and I'm going to take um, questions from the q and I'm not going to I'm not going to call on people so you can lower your hands. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to the written Q&A uh, questions and work from there for the rest of the discussion. Um, the, um, let me just, let me just see. Oh, the Maryland Senate race. I mean, look, the general view here about Maryland is that we should be okay there. There's going to be a, a, a intense primary on our side. Um, you know, there was a poll today by the Baltimore Sun that, you know, which is now in the hands of of a uh, of a Trumpy conservative owner, showing 
um, the governor, the incumbent, the former governor, Hook, in, in in decent shape. Those numbers have not been replicated in other independent polling. They have shown the race much closer. I've talked to people about this race who are in the Senate world on the Democratic side, and there's a general sense that, you know, we should be um, we should be okay there. Um, we are going to have an intense primary there, and I don't know who's going to win. And there's, you know, it's it's uh, for a small state, this is a pretty even and intense primary. And but I'm I'm not as worried. I'm not worried about Maryland. I mean, I think we should be able to win there. It's like a lot of things in this election. We should be able to win. We're more likely to win than they are, but it, but we have to do the work to make it to make it so. Um, let me just read uh, some of the other questions to see if I can get. Let me talk about RFK because this always comes up. I mean, the two the two issues that come up all the time are RFK and Israel Gaza. So let me just address them. <clears throat> Number one, RFK. I'm I'm just. It's important for everyone to realize that um, when we talk about rogue party, third party splinter party movements, the most important of those are with us. They're with the Democrats. It's the never Trump or never MAGAs. We have this unprecedented rebellion happening against Trump and the Republican Party. He, in his another moment of his idiocy, told Nikki Haley voters they're not welcome in the MAGA party, which was among the dumbest things we've ever seen a major candidate do in the modern era. And because um, he needs all those, he can't win the election without all of the Haley voters. <laughs> and the idea that he's telling them to go away is like, you know, not really smart. And so we could see an unprecedented thing happen in this election where there's this broad pro-democracy coalition established. You know, I don't know that Mitt Romney and Dick Cheney will campaign for Biden, but they may campaign against Trump. And I think that the permission structure that's going to be created for Republicans to not vote Republican this cycle will dwarf anything that we saw in 2020 and 2022, because frankly, Trump is more dangerous. And the, the parts of the Republican Party that are sensible and, and that are not Trumpers, not MAGA, are going to be working overtime to ensure that Trump doesn't win. And I just don't think we've ever seen anything like this. I mean, this is not like Jill Stein, this is not like Ralph Nader, right? This is some huge, heavily funded group of very serious politicians who are going to be spending the next seven months telling Republicans not to vote Republican. There's nothing like this that we've ever seen before. And I think that it's an existential threat to Trump, in my view. I mean, this is a, a very serious part of the election. Having said that, Robert Kennedy, you know, right now, his you should know that in the fall, he was polling at 14%. That's dropped down to 8%. He's dropping a point or two every month. And in part, because he's not a serious candidate, he's a ridiculous candidate. And nobody here should be scared of him or feel that he's got any kind of magical superpowers. He's ridiculous. And he has he's taken and said, he's taken ridiculous positions. He is a fraud, right? We've learned that the campaign is an adjunct of MAGA. His own campaign staff told us that 10 days ago. Um, and this thing is a gigantic, ridiculous fraud. That's an insult to our democracy and to all of us. And I think we're going to, we have a lot of ammunition and things that we can use to degrade him and to make him smaller and smaller. And we shouldn't give him power that he doesn't have. I mean, if he's going to be a major factor in this race, let him go earn it himself, right? Let's him, let him go out and fight it. I'm not worried about him. I think we can take him. And I think that the, um, you know, there are, I'll be talking more about some of the things that I think are are reasons to, that we can use to spread through our communities about why Kennedy is a fraud and why he's not a serious candidate and why at the end of the day, this basic argument that he's an independent and that he's fighting for people who are not aligned with either party is a lie in the way it was a lie for no labels too, by the way, congratulations, everybody know what no labels is gone. It's another dark Brandon moment in this election, right? Um, so don't get spooked by Kennedy. I mean, he, you know, Donald Trump's our opponent not Robert Kennedy. I mean, we're going to have to spend time, a little bit of time engaging him and degrading him, but he's doing a pretty good job himself at doing that. I mean, I, I've never seen a major politician who so often when he's in the middle of an interview on television, you know, is then accused of being a liar by the anchor. And then they show tape where he's just bald faced lying based on something he had said just recently, right? It's kind of shocking actually how how full of shit he is, to be honest. And um, and he's an strange figure in our, in, very Trumpian in many ways, right? He also in the last few weeks, and I'll be writing about this at Hopium, 
he's identified himself as a as a powerful proponent for Vladimir Putin, and he is part of this kind of people that have been penetrated by Russian influence in our politics. It's an amazing thing. We should be talking about it far more than we are. Um, but he has said things that place him to the right of Trump on Russia and Putin, amazingly, um, or to the you know in a similar place to Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's going to become material too, and in, in, in our ability to define him and degrade him. On Israel Gaza, I just want to say, and for those of you at Hopium, I, I, you know, I try to not to make this a major part of our daily work together because this is an area where there are disagreements in the family, and we have lots of areas where we agree. And I'd rather spend our limited time in the Hopium project, you know, on the things where we do agree. Um, but I, there isn't a lot of evidence that any of this is really hurting Biden. In fact, his poll numbers are going up. The Democratic Party poll numbers are going up. We have polling showing us ahead in Michigan by three points, right, for example. Um, you know, and I talk about how I wrote about this in Hopium that in the Economist YouGov weekly track last week, they <clears throat> asked, um, you know, most important issue and, and broke it out demographically. And among 18 to 29 year olds, the number of people who chose more, most important issue was uh, foreign policy was 2%, um, far below economy jobs, inflation, healthcare, climate change, you know, um, what was it, education, right? And what I've said about this issue of Israel Gaza is that what is the likely scenario over the next six and a half months is that it's an important issue, right? And we don't all agree on it, and that's okay. In a party, you don't have to agree on everything. Um, but the idea that there'll be large numbers of people voting on this as opposed to are they making more money? Is there, do they have health care? The loss of democracy, you know, the stripping of rights away and freedoms of more than half the population, reproductive freedom. The idea that this issue would become a voting issue for more than a small number of people is very, very unlikely. And um, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It could, anything can happen, but it's not likely. And it also isn't a major voting issue inside the Democratic coalition right now. And attempts to argue that it is, I think, are fact-free, in my view, or at least using facts in ways that are inconsistent with how I use them. There just isn't a lot of data showing significant opposition to Biden in the Democratic Party. Uh, if there was, there would have been a primary challenge. And um, so I think the party is actually more unified behind Biden than sometimes in these kinds of rooms believe. And I also will tell you that I can defend what Biden's done uh, in, in the Middle East. I think this is a tough issue. And, but what I try to promote to all of us is that we need to stick together and we can have disagreements and they don't have to become debilitating. You know, Obama used to say, we can disagree without just dis being disagreeable. And I do believe that some of the very extreme tactics that the critics of Biden have used has really alienated people that could be potential supporters for them in their position, including me, by the way, right? Attacking, you know, interrupting political events, shutting the traffic down on bridges and all this stuff. This stuff is not gaining them adherence. It's losing them adherence. And so while I think that the critics of Biden have a strong argument to make, I think the tactic, the extreme tactics that have been used have actually done a lot to hurt this movement and to make it and to and to deny them adherence they could have gotten by staying more respectful to the president, more respectful to the people in the political process. And that's also something we could disagree on. I understand that. Um, but let me get to um, let me get to a few more questions um, from all of you here. I want to be clear that I don't think that we should, I'm getting questions about the trial and convictions. I don't think we need any convictions this year to win the election. I don't think we should count on them. We waited for Mueller. That was a mistake. It prevented us from having a significant conversation with the American people about the penetration of Donald Trump and the Republican Party by a hostile foreign power. And we shouldn't wait for Jack Smith. We shouldn't wait for prosecutors in New York. We have these six things that I went through with you earlier that don't require conviction for us to be able to talk in the political arena. I mean, the legal arena is one thing. The political arena is something else. In the political arena, Donald Trump raped Eugene Carroll in a department store dressing room. Donald Trump oversaw one of the largest financial frauds in American history. Donald Trump stole America's secrets and betrayed the country. Donald Trump tried to overturn American democracy and end it for all time. Donald Trump has taken more money from foreign governments than any politician in modern American history. Donald Trump ended Roe 
and uh, as it staked out the most extreme abortion positions you could possibly stake out. We don't need any of these convictions to win this election. And we have to stop using the idea that our ability to engage on these issues is contingent upon a jury finding him guilty. They aren't. These things happened. They're facts on the ground. And in the political world, that's fair game. And so don't be, don't worry, don't over worry about the machinations in court. I think we've spent too much time. In some ways, what's happening with Donald Trump in court is like become democratic ESPN, right? Like we're following, it's like the box score in a baseball game. I think it's, we've spent way too much time thinking about it. We need to be thinking about how we win this election and how we talk to more voters and how we raise more money. That's where our focus has to be. I'm gonna let other people worry about the court cases. I think it's immaterial in many ways to what's gonna happen. Yes, him being in court and being looking like a small man and a criminal man and a puffy hair man with his crazy orange face man and being looking like a pathetic guy who's claiming that he's being mistreated, which he's lying about. All of that I think is making him look smaller and I think it's really hurting him. And so I think the court cases are, I think the most consequential thing is that when he has to sit there all day long, he looks like a criminal, right? He doesn't look powerful and strong. He looks weak and pathetic. And I think this is a big problem for him in this continued effort to create this impression of strong man that he tries to create this false identity. You know, I, I talk about how, you know, all the things that we need to do to win are within our power to do in a campaign. Doesn't mean we'll do them, right? I mean, I joke that, you know, we're like a higher seed in the NCAA tournament. It doesn't mean we're going to win. We have to go actually win the election. But I think the things they have to do to make him look like a serious presidential candidate, again, is beyond the ability of a campaign to do. And I think he is this ridiculous figure. I think the emperor has no clothes. I think we have to pull the curtain back from the wizard, whatever our now these analogies are that we use about these frauds, these silly people that when they're exposed, their silliness, you're like, how in the world did we ever treat that person like a serious person. I think we're getting closer to that. I think I think he's really taken some big hits. I mean, if this is this video, this fake story on TV that he tells, we're learning that there's an actor behind that who's not, you know, who's wears a lot of makeup and has fake hair. And, you know, I have this phrase that with Trump, you know, you can dye his hair and paint his face and strap a girdle on him and a diaper two and pump him full of speed. And he's still never going to look like a serious presidential candidate ever again. I think we have to mock him more. I think we have to make fun of him more. His company has plummeted, you know, all these things that big L loser, right. And not big strong man. These are things that are important for us to mock him and make fun of him because it's like the witch melting in the wizard of Oz. He melts. And I do think there's a 20, 25% chance that Trump collapses that we won this election by eight to 10 points. I think that's within the realm of the possible. I don't think that's like pie in the sky stuff because he is different than other candidates. He's different than Trump 2020. He's far worse. He's more awful. He's more horrible. He's more dangerous. He's more threatening. I mean, you know, if you need any confirmation of that, I mean, the fact that millions of women in Arizona and Florida are about to lose their reproductive freedom because of Donald Trump is about to happen in front of our eyes. This is not something that happened before. It's happening right in front of us. MAGA continues to expand its threat to our rights and freedoms across the country. That's why we're all here, right? That's why we're fighting so hard. Yeah, he should drop out. He's a rapist. It's sh eternal shame on Republicans for rallying behind this historically awful human being who's doing so much embarrassment um, to the country. Um, the... Um, no, there's no preaching to the choir, Susan. There's, that, that, I want to I want to address that. Um, you know, Susan asks, "Isn't I just preaching the choir?" Yeah. No, because I I think I, one thing I was really proud of this week is that the treasurer of the DNC, who I don't know, and I have to now reach out to her, wrote an email to I'm assuming these are donors to the Democratic Party, but to her email list, and quoted me at the beginning saying Simon Rosenberg wrote this piece in the New Republic about how we have to become information warriors for our democracy, that I wanna reimagine with all of you the war room. I was in the war room 32 years ago as a young guy getting yelled at by James Carville every day, you know, and, um, and I, I want us to think about in our work, not only do we do all this work through texting and phone calling and postcarding and all the donating, donating we're doing 
to build the biggest democratic, the most successful and powerful democratic political machine we've ever seen. But we also have to become information warriors for our democracy. And what I mean by that is that we have to think of not the war room, not as 20 sweaty kids drinking Red Bulls and producing TikTok videos, but we need to think of the war room as two to three million of us wired together, amplifying the good work of Joe Biden, the Democrats, and spreading that information you know, through our networks. We need to not ask what Joe Biden and the DNC are going to do to get loud. We have to we have to tell them what we're going to do to get loud, right? What our role is in all this. Tucker Carlson was the most powerful commentator in American politics with 3 million viewers a night. If two to 3 million of us reach 10 people a day, that's 20 to 30 million people. And I think that we underestimate our power that we have to influence the national dialogue. I'm, you know, I joke that based on my tug, my dog tug, my 11 and a half year old English bulldog, who's over my shoulder here, he and I are giving you permission now tonight. We're deputizing you as information warriors for your democracy. You don't need anybody's permission to do this. Think of it as an information age victory garden, right? If all of us spread a little bit of good stuff every day, it becomes a very loud chorus that becomes very loud together. And I think this is really important. I mean, I think this is a, a different way of understanding our agency and our power and our ability to influence things. And I'll tell a story, and some of you who are older Hopium members know this story, that Irene, who's an active member in our chat and in our in, at Hopium, a paid subscriber, told a story a few months ago in the chat that she was out to dinner with three of her girlfriends and they're all dumping on Biden. And she said, Simon, I used all this stuff I learned at Hopium to tell them what a good president Joe Biden's been. And by the end of the dinner, they're all on board and they'd come around, right? And I now had three new recruits for, you know, being warriors for Joe Biden. Well, we all have moments like that every day and we have to take them seriously, right? We have to understand that if people view us as being politically active and a little bit more knowledgeable, you know, we can bring converts and bring, bring, bring people along. Don't just focus on what the DNC and Biden's doing. They're going to do a lot. They have a ton of money. They're going to be producing. I think the Biden campaign is producing incredibly high quality media. Their social media video engagement is pioneering. They're building an entire new vernacular and way of communicating as Democrats. But we have a big job to do here ourselves. And, you know, that's why I talk at Hopium about doing more, worrying less. We need to worry less. We worry too much. And, and I know why. Like I, I built Hopium because I worry a lot. And I wanted to make sure I was leaving it all in the playing field. Um, you know, and but, you know, recognize that we have a rare, very powerful story to tell. And you should be thinking every day about how you advance that story just a little bit. One of the things I do at Hopium, for example, is I share the Biden ads all the time because I want you to see what people in the battlegrounds are seeing because many of us don't live in the battlegrounds, right? But you need to see what they're seeing because you can spread those videos and those ads. Not all of them are 30 second spots. Some of them, like the thing I released today was 60 seconds. That's not going to be on television. It's a digital ad. You can spread that through your networks if you want people to see what he's doing. I will tell you, I'm a former TV producer and writer. I grew up in the TV news business. I have primetime writer producer credits under my belt. And I think the media Biden campaign is producing is really high quality and really effective and really good. I'm really encouraged by it. It's another reason why I'm optimistic. I feel like these guys know where they need to go. They understand at the core of this election and these issues around freedom and democracy and preserving our, you know, the America that we all know and that, um, and that that's where the center of the core of Biden world and the Biden media is really going, which is they know that Joe Biden knows that this is a battle to preserve everything that's made America great and the envy of the world. Um, and that's where a lot of their media and their communications is really coming from. All of you give them a little bit more credit, right? I know that we've been in this place where Biden's distant and he's not communicating, he's not connecting with voters and the polls are terrible. We're not there anymore. The campaign's on. They're producing amazing stuff. Biden's campaigning all over the country. Donald Trump is sitting in his basement, right? Like we are in a very strong position right now, but we have to go execute. We should win this game, but there's no guarantee. It's how well we play, right? How hard you work, what we do together, right? That will make a difference. And we should win, but it's only if we do the work, right? At Hopium, we, the way we talk about this is that it's hope with a plan. Right. We don't want the we just don't hope the election is going to go well. We work to make it so. 
we have enormous opportunity, I think, in this election to make it so. And wherever you are, starting in California and New York and these house races that we have to flip, if you live in the battlegrounds, if you want to be a Californian that makes calls into Michigan, God bless you all. Whatever you do, it all matters. And it brings more people into this, what I call a virtuous cycle of participation. The more that other Americans see other Americans doing, the more likely it is they will do too, right? You're creating a permission structure for other Americans to take action to preserve and save their democracy. You become a persuader in that regard, right? And, um, and you make, you create a, what I call a virtuous cycle of participation. The more people that are participating, the more people that will participate. And that's how you build a powerful campaign, by the way, is through what we call a virtuous cycle of participation. We are deep into a very powerful virtuous cycle of participation as Democrats right now. The Republicans can't match us. They got 200 oligarchs. We got two to 3 million Americans who love their country and are fighting like hell to preserve it and save it. I'd much rather be on a team of two to 3 million people than 200 oligarchs. Um, let me go and just look at a couple other questions and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, and for those of you who live in Arizona and Phoenix, I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday. And I look forward to seeing folks in Arlington County, um, uh, uh, Virginia on Saturday night, where I'll be speaking at an event. Um, the, let me just look at other questions here that I think are sort of group questions. Um, I've answered the Gaza question. Um, I, I don't think it's a major issue in the election today. It doesn't mean it won't be. But I want to be very clear is that I, I think we can't get too spooked by it. We get spooked very easily in the Democratic Party. Um, where's Nikki Haley? Nikki Haley just, uh, Stephen asked, where's Nikki Haley? She just took a job at the Hudson Institute today. <laughs> um, you know, she's, she's, you know, Donald Trump said she's not welcome in his campaign. So she's not making major efforts to become part of his campaign. Um, and the, um, I wanted, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. I mean, I just am amazed how much focused all of you, many of you are on negative stuff and not all the positive stuff that's happening. Um, let me let me do this. Let me close with a final kind of way, you know, of thinking about where we are in the current moment. And and so, first of all, let me just say, um, yeah, I know people are scared, but being scared is is I, I'm seeing you know uh, comments on this. Don't be scared, it's a choice. Being scared is a choice, right? You don't need to be scared, I'm not scared. I think we're gonna kick their ass, I'm not worried, right? I think we're gonna win. Being scared and being worried is a choice that you make, right? I, you should do more and worry less. We have to get out of this mindset of being scared and being powerless. We're not powerless. I've discussed all these things tonight that you can do to be more powerful, to make a difference and so, let me close on two ways of getting deeper into that. One is that one thing all of you should do tomorrow, even if you did it today, is you should call your House members and ask them to vote for the Ukraine bill on Friday and demand that they not only vote for it, but they fight for it. We have an opportunity to do something historic and important for our country. We are weaker today and in danger as a country because the Republicans have appeased Putin and have now held up this Ukraine funding. We look weak to our adversaries. We are in a dangerous place because of their appeasement of Putin and of autocrats. We can fix that this week, potentially. This battle over passing this Ukraine funding that Mike Johnson has teed up is really critical. All of you have an important role to play. Make your calls into Congress. Do it twice, do it three times tomorrow. Do it on Thursday, do it on Friday. You know, encourage all of your friends to do it too. Many Hopian members today made calls into the house. We saw people talking about it on our chat. You, that's something, rather than being scared and worried, that's something you can do tomorrow. And then finally, let me talk to you about the core of why I'm really here at Hopian and why I'm doing this tonight with all of you, in addition to understanding the, the stakes of this election and this time that we're in, that we all need to want to believe that we're doing everything we can to make sure that our democracy and our freedoms are there for our kids and our grandkids the way they've been here for us, right? That's why we're all here. But I go to a deeper reason why I'm really here and what's driving this Hopian project. And it gets to something that Joe Biden talked about in his State of the Union address. He talked at the State of the Union about FDR's State of the Union speech in 1941, where he 
rallied America and prepared them for the fight that was going to come to defeat authoritarianism and autocracy and fascism in Europe. And he discussed this idea of rallying and he applied it a little bit to the current moment. It was in, in essentially that he was trying, if you remember, he did something unusual in that speech where rather than starting with the economy and jobs and healthcare and so on, he started with this threat to our democracy globally and domestically. And he saw himself, I think, in that moment as giving a, a watered down, not a watered down, but a, a version of the speech that FDR gave. He didn't do it as aggressively as FDR did because we're at a different moment, but he evoked that speech. And in that speech, FDR, lay, among other things, laid out a vision of the world that he wanted to see after World War II that was based on freedom, the four freedoms, freedom of want, freedom of fear, freedom of worship, freedom of, of speech, right? Those are the four freedoms, these very elegant, sort of simple thing that FDR said, I wanna build a world around these four freedoms. And I think that that speech was the most important speech ever given in American English, political speech ever given in American English, because those four freedoms became the foundation of the Atlantic Charter that Churchill and FDR signed in late 1941, which became the basis of the alliance that won World War II. They became the basis, the foundation of the UN Charter in 1945, that sort of imagined a world of free countries and free states that don't have dominion over one another, right? Where war was not a tool, authoritarian and dominion wasn't a tool where free states could live and people could live, you know, on their own and pursue their dreams. They became, those four freedoms became the foundation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was launched in 1948, which created for the first time in our international system of an understanding of the rights and freedoms of regular people, not just states. This was a huge evolution in the way that we understood the modern world. Nothing like this had ever happened before on the global stage. And the way I like to think about the evolution and the exportation of four freedoms is that it was a form of exporting the core American understanding of the world, which is that we built a country that wasn't based on dominion and authority and oligarchs and kings, but on the power of people, that we had more agency and power, that we were building a society based on folks and not powerful people. And we were exporting that to the rest of the world, the American dream, the ability to pursue your dreams wherever you were. And that world that we, that FDR imagined and that we have then built together over the last 80 years has created a golden age in human history. There's never been a better time to be alive than there's been in this period of the four freedoms and the Pax Americana. You know, we've life expectancy has gone from 45 years to 71 years. Literacy rates have tripled and gotten to places that were unimaginable 50 years ago. Extreme poverty has plummeted even though the population of the world's increased dramatically. And more people have lived under democracies in recent years than any time in human history. It's been a golden age to be alive over the last 80 years. There's never been a better time to be alive than during these last 80 years. And what's important for us to recognize is that we did that. The Democratic Party of the United States did that. We created this golden age in human history. And I believe that we're part of arguably the most noble political project in all of human history, because we've done more good for more people than any other organized political force, not religious force in, America, in, in world history. And that we have to be inspired by this, right? Because what FDR did in 1941, which Joe Biden was referring to, as he called on Americans to rise up to defend freedom and democracy around the world. And we did, right? Americans answered that call. Well, I think what Joe Biden's trying to do now is that he's trying to make a new call. And that what's so inspiring to me is that all of you are answering that call. The two to three million, four million Americans are getting up every day and doing a little bit to preserve their democracy, to ensure that the freedoms and opportunities that we had are there for our kids and our grandkids, that that golden age that I described is there for our kids and our grandkids and the grandkids and the grandkids of all the people of the world. And that what I'm so inspired by this Hopian project is that I feel like I'm in a community of people who every day are answering that call and that we're making an enormous difference. We've been winning elections. We've been doing things that no one thought was possible. We've been raising tons of money. We've been doing the good work that we need to do to ensure that our grandkids had the same opportunities and freedoms that we all had. We understand the gravity of the moment. We understand why people are scared and frightened, but we're not sitting in our houses and doing nothing. We're going to work. We're doing the work that's necessary in order to win. 
And I'm so proud to be in this fight with all of you. And I know everyone, I want to be very clear about this. Even though it doesn't feel it every day, we are winning. Democracy and freedom is going to prevail. This election is the big one. We all need to do whatever we thought we were going to do. We need to give a little bit more money and do a little bit more work. we got to leave it all on the playing field. We have no choice. That's why we're all here. That's why we're part of the Hopium community. That's why it's such an exciting project to be part of because we are making, we are doing everything we can to make sure that those four freedoms are there for the people of the world as they've been over the last 80 years. The Democratic Party was called once before, we're being called again. And all of you are answering that call. And I just wanna say thanks to everybody for what you're doing because we're changing the world and we're making the future better for all the people of the world. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Keep fighting hard.